Hi and welcome. I'm sitting with my father and today we're going to talk about some more nuances to face attractiveness than just a square face. Mewing, orthotropics and a lot of what we talk about this channel is about facial beauty, facial attractiveness. And we kind of, in a broad brush, talk about upswung, squarer, more prognathic, forward-growing faces as more attractive than downswung, long, thin, retractive faces. Now, in a broad concept, I think that's true, but there is more nuance to things. You know, our attitudes on many concepts of what we find desirable, beautiful, attractive, whatever this is, changes over time. I thought we would try something where I would go through some images, asking my father's opinion and discussing them as we went. And we'll go through a couple of other areas that have changed their sort of concept of attractiveness from um, being tanned to being um, skinny or slightly Rubenesque and facial attractiveness. In fact, we're going to start with the um, Rubenesque first. So, Dad, I've got an image here. This is Rubens' I've seen it before, image many, over time. many times. It's not a new yes, image. No, Rubens now, was known for his, shall I say, plump women. But at the, the time, this is what we considered attractive. Well, uh, in uh, probably quite a narrow period of time, although I think fashion changed more slowly in those days than it does now. But surely when everyone, the majority of the population were skinny because yep. they didn't have enough food. You're right. Then people who were slightly heavier, slightly plumper, they were the, the, the few people, yep. and they were the more desirable people, so, and they were the richer people. You're right, the wealthy were fatter because they ate more food, the poor couldn't afford it. Yeah, so in that time, Ruben and, and at that time, there's no doubt that fat people were considered, um, shall I say, more attractive? More appealing, I think, was perhaps a better word. But then that could easily then become more attractive. Indeed, so closely linked. Closely linked. And then, of course, we've moved on to this era in the really quite recent past of these incredibly thin models. Yes. Um, I have always preferred the 38, 22, 36 shape myself. And I actually think that probably be more natural. Yes, and I think maybe we're going away from these overly skinned girls now. Yes. Yes, and I think probably not a bad thing for all the anorexia and things. It Maybe it's precipitating. Now, let's move on to <clears throat> pale skin. So this is a picture of, this is an enactment. I remember that picture well. Yeah, but this is sort of, this is an enactment of Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I. She was reputed to um, make her face pale, but she wasn't the only one. It was really quite common back then, well, yes. in that era, to yes. make your face pale. Well, yes, the farm labourers spent their days in the fields and got very brown, and the posh people stayed at home and therefore didn't get the sun. Yeah, very true. And, of course, in the same way, that has changed to people lying on the beach getting tanned. Well, yes, these days, of course, it's the reverse. And therefore, people tend to want to look brown because they feel that it's a sign that you've had a summer holiday abroad. And you were able to get out. Well, maybe. Yes, you're out of the office. Although, clearly, that's all yeah. changing now. And, of course, you know, obviously, although... It, you know, some people push this too far. Uh, could be. I'm looking at those two pictures there. People. And um, yes, they look a bit too bound to me. Yes, but then in a, in a same vein, a little bit of something that seems to be good, some people will think a lot would be better. Yes, the, the, the idea of beauty always swings on a pendulum from one extreme to another, and at different times, we'll appreciate different patterns. Yeah, and I think they represent an extreme. Yes. Okay, so now this is an image, but apparently it's an image of Homer. I guess no one really knows what Homer looks like. Indeed. But, but clearly people were making busts that were representative of a theme mm. in the past. Now, th this Homer, or whoever this person was, we're talking about, what, 3,000 years ago? Yes. 
And clearly he's got craniofacial dystrophy. You're indeed, absolutely. And he's got, well, we discussed it earlier, is this, you know, we, we'd call it a, a, a big nose, a big Roman nose? Yes, I'm looking at that, and to me, it's not quite accurate. His face is set back so far that he would have adopted a, a tilted neck and head. Therefore, his forehead should have been more sloped. But it's just an image, and I think the artist used a bit of license. Most likely, since we didn't know what Homer actually looked like. Or but the craniofacial dystrophy has been around a long time. Indeed. Yes. And I think the image here I've got is someone in the 1920s when I, I got the impression from sort of posters I've seen and images I've seen that this is when it almost became almost fashionable to have a slightly downswung face. I think uh, it would be described as petite, wouldn't it? Yes. And I know exactly what you mean. There are fairly good cheekbones in that picture, yeah. but the chin is back, and yes, it's down. But I think at, certainly in the maybe the 20s, that appearance was considered attractive amongst women because at that time they shouldn't be strong characters. They were demure and possibly recessive too. Yes, yeah, I, I guess, yes, I've, I've not even thought of that. But if I move on to the last slide, so these are people actually on St Kilda. I managed to get a photograph just before they were moved because they, they resettled the people on St Kilda. Right. Um, all of these people, broad, wide faces. And when yeah. I look through the images of people from this era, it seems that everywhere You're... throughout the UK, yeah. where I was looking, all of the farm hands and yep. all the farm people, yep. there's not, this isn't representative of Justin Kilder, it was just a good photograph I managed to get. It seems to be representative of basically everyone in this era that were not in the rich classes, not in the privileged classes. Yes, I think basically they <laughs> ate much harder food. Yeah, and tougher food. You know, they couldn't well, live on milk and honey. No, absolutely not. They would always have the lean cuts of meat and they would basically eat very hard food, which required chewing. And you can see this from these teeth that they yeah, teeth had, the which were worn on the top. And the average modern person doesn't wear the cusps of their teeth appreciably in their lifetime. No, no. Indeed, when you look at the skulls of these yes. people, they had fairly heavy wear on their teeth. Yeah. <clears throat> but of course, when it comes to good facial form, these people had physically better facial form from a health perspective than the image of Homer or the image of that girl in the 1920s. You're right. And yet, th at the time, there would have been a certain level of attraction to that face. Yes. What interests me is I look at those faces and they don't terribly appeal to me. No. I think in reality, main, the main problem is that all of them appear to have full cheeks. And therefore, uh, it, I'm always attracted to dimples in the cheeks. Mm. And there are very Hollow few cheeks. there. Interesting, interesting. Well, why do you think that might be? I think it's probably a different eating pattern. And I think by then, many of them were bottle feeding. And I think that do you think, could be I, a factor. I would, I would doubt that with this group. I would highly doubt this group were bottle feeding. Well, I think bottle feeding started quite a long time ago. I sh should look up. But I would believe that bottle feeding was fairly universal by the beginning of the 1800s. In the past, we had a sense we were attracted to the, 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 the rich people, the powerful people, simply because they were rich or powerful. Indeed. And now we've gone down to the state where we still have some vestige of hangover from that. So, you know, some noble, longer faces... Yes, yes, there's no doubt about that. Still, look, the air of authority, that air of um, power, of wealth. Yes, um, you think of the Duke of Wellington, for instance. Yes. With his very large nose and flat face. Was considered very attractive at the time. Oh, indeed. Yeah. You've got social 
and fashion pressures overlaid on the top of the simple what we're hardwired yes. to be attracted to? There always have been, yes. How would you weigh these two influences? Well, I would say that basically we have the ideal face in the middle, but there is a pendulum effect which swings each side of that. And that is dictated by fashion, not by the genes. The genes identify the center point as ideal. I sometimes think that the whole concept behind getting straight teeth yeah. is that people with naturally straight teeth have very good facial form. Yeah. And so people want to emulate this by straightening yeah. their own teeth. They think that straight teeth are equivalent to good-looking faces. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I think also you've got the situation where I see a lot of people who have had their teeth straightened and it looks unnatural in their faces. You, you, just, you can see it looks unnatural. Yeah. There's something strange about it. Particularly if they've had a lot of expansion. Particularly if they've had a lot of expansion within their face, yes. Yeah. And yet it, don't, it doesn't fit the face. Mm. And they have this big, broad smile yeah. and a little narrow face. Yes. Yeah. And yet there's an actress, Julia... Roberts? Yes. She has a lovely wide smile, but it fits her face beautifully. Because she's got good facial yeah. growth. It was natural. Yeah. So, listen, thank you very much. Um, we want to continue our journey on this YouTube video, and we hope you'll come with us.